So as you could hear, recording is in progress. So let's start with uh, another brief introduction now for the video audience as well. So the topic of today uh, within the framework of infrastructure connectivity in Europe with Chinese characteristics is energy and climate issues. This is a new series launched by uh, Working Group 1 of Churn Coast Action. And uh, we decided to cover various topics. Uh, besides today's topic, that is energy and climate issues, we're going to deal with transportation issues as well as digitalization. But let's stick to the energy and uh, climate issues topic uh, for today. We have three distinguished presenters, all of them being uh, relatively newcomers in the VG, which means that they have joined the working group only recently. We're going to start with a macro kind of approach of Alexander Svetlicini from uh, University of Macau. He's talking about, he's going to talk about Chinese investment in European energy sector from merger control to FDI screening. Then we will narrow down the topic to case studies. We will have first Tiago Carvalho from uh, University of Lisbon. Uh, he's going to talk about Chinese investment in the Portuguese power grid. And uh, finally, uh, we will have Alexander Matkovic from the Institute for Economic Sciences, Belgrade, about outsourcing pollution, environmental degradation related to Chinese projects in the Balkans. Uh, we will have uh, 20 minutes for each presentation, which means that after an hour, we will have the opportunity to comment uh, these interesting presentations or ask questions from the presenters. So Alexander, the floor is yours. You can start sharing your screen and talk about this very interesting topic. Uh, all right, thank you, Agnes. Uh, thank, thank you for introduction uh, and also welcoming me to the um, working group one. Um, <clears throat> uh, so as you already mentioned, uh, my intention is uh, uh, to take, so, so to say, a bird's view perspective on the uh, Chinese investments in the um, uh, European in energy sector and uh, look at it um, um, at the level of the EU, uh, primarily uh, through the two um, regulatory frameworks, uh, that is being uh, EU merger control uh, and um, the foreign direct investment uh, screening framework, which has been adopted relatively recently. Uh, so my presentation basically will cover the following things. Um, first, I would like to give uh, an overview of the um, uh, Chinese SOE acquisitions uh, in the energy sector that uh, have been in the ambit of the EU merger regulation. Then we also will discuss uh, which transactions are included into that ambit and which are not and for which reason. Uh, I also would like to address um, several um, SOE related procedural and substantive issues or challenges that have been raised uh, uh, during the assessment of these um, acquisitions by the EU Commission. Uh, and then we can briefly discuss also um, some um, regulatory gaps that have been alleged by different stakeholders that there are in the EU merger control that um, uh, require uh, a supplementary additional uh, regulatory response to certain issues, to certain challenges. And one of these regulatory responses was the um, uh, EU FDI screening regulation, which was adopted in 2019. And um, since October last year is already in full force and, and operation. And we will discuss um, some examples from the member states FDI screening legislation, because essentially uh, FDI screening is done at the level of e each member state uh, when, when they apply it to the, uh, to the energy sector. Uh, also by mentioning some projects and programs uh, of the union interest, um, which could fall into the uh, under scrutiny by the by the EU Commission. And I would like to conclude then my presentation by highlighting uh, three regulatory frameworks that are going to affect uh, FDI uh, from uh, from China in the EU, um, specifically in the energy sector. So that is that is my plan. Uh, so uh, let's look briefly at the um, economic concentrations that have been uh, notified and examined by the EU. 
here I selected only those which involve um, a Chinese state-owned enterprises uh, and also in the field of um, uh, in the field of energy. Uh, when we look at this um, list, which is not that long, um, we will actually see some um, uh, transactions that have not really uh, raised um, uh, much attention uh, in in the public. Uh, they have also been cleared without um, without conditions. And the main reason are the um, uh, procedural um, requirements or procedural conditions of the EU merger regulation. Uh, in order to fall under the EU merger regulation, uh, first of all, it should be a concentration uh, in terms that it is an acquisition of control. So we can immediately uh, put aside any kind of acquisitions of minority shareholding because that would not be covered by the EU uh, merger control. So, so it should be an ac acquisition of control, taking over control over, over a company, over a joint venture. Uh, secondly, there are some um, uh, th procedural thresholds that have to be met in order for concentration to be reviewed under the EU merger control. For that, there are certain turnover thresholds that the parties to the concentration should met. And um, if you see um, at this list, you will mainly notice uh, those companies, those large Chinese SOEs that have been already active both globally and on the EU markets. And because they realize such a large turnover, uh, their concentrations have to be automatically notified under the EU merger control. So as a result here, we will not see uh, many um, uh, investment projects that are done at the member state level, but which did not reach these thresholds and therefore were not reviewed by the EU Commission under the uh, merger control regulation. Um, this um, uh, this um, mergers and acquisitions by the Chinese state-owned enterprises, they have raised a number of questions that have been challenging and have to be answered by the Commission under this EU uh, merger control uh, regulation. Uh, uh, first is that um, um, unlike uh, in the company law where we always uh, separate companies as distinct legal persons, uh, merger control is part of the competition law framework and there we look at uh, companies as um, uh, market players. Uh, and as such, uh, there is a concept that is called a single economic unit. Uh, and basically uh, if um, let's say um, one company, a parent company, has control over two or three subsidiary companies for the purposes of um, uh, merger control or for the purposes of competition law. Uh, they can be viewed as a single economic unit, even though legally they are um, legally they are different legal persons. They are different uh, different companies. So, in relation to the uh, Chinese state-owned enterprises, uh, because um, many of them are controlled at the central level in China. One of the questions arise, so where is the single economic unit there? And is it possible to regard, um, for example, uh, several Chinese SOEs as part of the same economic unit? Um, the question, the answer to this question is very important because it will affect these procedural thresholds. So for example, if a single Chinese SOE might not reach certain turnover because it has relatively little presence on the, on the European market, then if we will take them together as a single economic unit, then the turnover uh, threshold, I mean, their turnover, their joint turnover will of course increase. And then the, the concentration will have to be notified. So that is why uh, it is quite important to uh, answer this question and the commission has attempted to do it in several cases. Uh, also, um, the way how the state exercises control over the state owned enterprises will also be important in the competitive assessment. Because uh, when we uh, assess concentrations or mergers, we try to predict how these companies are going to behave on the market after the merger. So uh, if we understand or do not understand well how the state is exercising control and directing the uh, behavior of these uh, companies, then it will create certain difficulties for us in this assessment uh, of how they are going to behave on the market post-merger. So uh, let's take some example. <clears throat> Uh, here is a concentration um, where um, a Chinese uh, state-owned company uh, in the field of uh, nuclear energy, CGN, and um, a French uh, state-owned um, electricity company uh, jointly uh, acquire control over uh, several um, uh, nuclear power plants in, um, 
uh, in the United Kingdom uh, in order to uh, jointly implement their uh, nuclear power generation technology. Um, this con concentration had to be notified because of the, of the turnover thresholds to the EU Commission, and the EU Commission has to try to answer those questions or those, those issues that I mentioned uh, in that case. So this case is um, um, unique in a sense that this is for the first time where the European Commission has been able to answer this question, question affirmatively. So what was the answer? <clears throat> um, the answer was here that the CGN, uh, which is under the control of the central state administration uh, for the state-owned assets in China, so it's a centrally controlled um, SOE, uh, because of the strategic importance of the energy sector uh, for, the, uh, for the state, um, could not be regarded as autonomous or independent from the state in deciding on the major uh, issues like a business plan or, or budget. And also, uh, it was uh, concluded in this case that therefore other energy sector SOEs, at least those centrally controlled, should be regarded as part of the same single economic unit together with the CGN. And actually, because of this conclusion that the EU Commission has arrived in this case, the concentration was notifiable. Why? Because of course, jointly, the, um, the, the, the uh, energy um, uh, sector SOEs, of course, would reach those thresholds, without which maybe the CGN alone would not reach that threshold in the EU, in the EU and so the transaction would not be uh, would be not notified. So um, this case basically has um, set certain precedent or a possibility how the Commission is going to view um, the, the state-owned enterprises from China. And for us, it's important because that was actually decided in the field of energy. And here, exactly, uh, this sector was analyzed by the Commission in detail. Um, there is also, um, I also should mention that besides the assessment based on the, uh, on the competition, so how the companies are going to behave on the market after the merger, uh, there is also a limited possibility uh, to uh, consider um, certain other interests other than competition. Um, and these legitimate interests that are recognized in the EU merger regulations are public security, uh, plurality of the media and prudential rules. No, for us, probably the most important one would be here, public security. So while EU merger control is a one-stop shop system where the concentration is notified only to the EU Commission, regardless whether the companies are active in several member states, the EU Commission will issue the decision and this decision will be valid for this project, doesn't matter uh, where, in which member state it is implemented. So uh, based on this article 21.4, uh, member states might raise this concern or these uh, legitimate interests and block the transaction or uh, require certain conditions for the transaction. So impose certain conditions on the parties. Um, and uh, there is a, a mixed experience uh, in, this, in this field where uh, some member states attempted to block or conditions uh, mergers that have been cle cleared by the EU Commission. Uh, for example, um, there are two recent, no, relatively recent cases uh, where the um, uh, Spanish authorities uh, tried to condition uh, the acquisition of the Spanish energy company by imposing various um, um, investment obligations, um, different economic obligations on the companies uh, taking over uh, the, the Spanish company. Uh, and in that case, they tried to use um, the legitimate interest as public security, saying that the energy supply is a public security matter and therefore uh, they, they feel it necessary to uh, impose those conditions. In both of these cases, uh, the European Commission has analyzed those conditions and found them not to be related to the public security. So in those cases, uh, they insisted on the unconditional clearance and did not permit, in that case, uh, Spanish authorities to impose those additional economic investment obligations on the, uh, on the parties. Um, so there is a um, um, re relatively limited uh, experience in applying this uh, public security under the merger control, and also some examples where public security was understood quite strictly, uh, and it was not permitted uh, to use uh, certain uh, economic uh, interests under the label of the public security. 
Um, all these clearances uh, of the merger transactions involving uh, Chinese uh, state-owned um, enterprises, um, and uh, especially after the uh, European Commission has blocked um, uh, some, some merger that um, uh, member states considered of uh, uh, great importance for their industrial policy. Uh, here I'm talking about the Siemens uh, Alstom transaction, which was not permitted on the uh, grounds of competition. Uh, there was um, uh, a discussion whether uh, the EU merger control uh, is capable at addressing different um, uh, concerns, uh, which maybe are not um, related to the competition, but to a wider um, issues like a level playing field, uh, industrial policies, uh, competitiveness of the European industry. And so um, this, kind of, um, uh, this kind of criticisms um, have led to um, some supplementary um, regulatory responses. And one of them, uh, as you know, was the adoption of the EU FDI screening regulation. Um, since since many of you uh, probably are aware of the, uh, of the structure of it, uh, I just only mention briefly um, uh, several aspects which are maybe will be later important uh, when we will talk about the um, uh, energy sector. Uh, so EU FDI screening regulation basically does not introduce any kind of new FDI screening rules. It basically introduces uh, some uh, common standards for the members to take into account when they adopt their national FDI screening legislation. And it introduces certain um, cooperation, information and cooperation mechanism uh, involving other member states and the um, uh, European Commission. Uh, so um, among different um, protected uh, interests, uh, the EU Commission in the regulation listed infrastructure uh, technologies and, and input. Uh, and when we are talking about energy, uh, probably <laughs> um, energy could be fit into uh, any of these categories. And we will see it later when we look at the national legislation. Also, among the factors that can be taken into account by the member state which is undertaking screening can be um, foreign state ownership or foreign state control over the investor. So this could be one of the criteria that can be taken into account when screening a particular, uh, particular transaction. Um, and then uh, European Commission has uh, issued a guidance um, during the uh, pandemic time in order to encourage uh, member states to speed up the adoption of their national FDI screening. So let's look what is the situation on the ground and how the member states have incorporated energy sector into their um, into the uh, uh, FDI screening frameworks. Uh, first, I should mention that uh, not all of the member states have notified their FDI uh, screening legislation uh, because uh, some uh, member states still do not have any uh, comprehensive, uh, comprehensive FDI screening. Uh, there are some, of course, there are some news saying that uh, they are considering or drafting the legislation, but at the moment, uh, that is the situation as of uh, 30th of March when the last update uh, was published by the, by the EU Commission. So most of them have, but some still did not adopt uh, FDI screening. Now, uh, when, we, um, when we mention the, the issue of FDI screening, uh, we usually, when we say FDI, we are thinking about a foreign investor. Um, since our discussion today um, is about investments from, from China, but actually if we would look at the FDI legislation of those member states who notified uh, FDI screening frameworks, we will see that the term foreign investor is very differently understood uh, in different member states. And we will see that some member states regard as foreign, not only non-EU investors, but even uh, investors coming from other member states, or sometimes they do not uh, distinguish even between um, foreign and domestic investors and basically apply this screening as long as the acquisition or investment is in particular critical sector. So there is a quite a diversity there as to what is regarded as foreign in the, in the legislation of the, of the member states. Now, <clears throat> if we will look at the, how energy sector is included and covered in the FDI uh, screening frameworks, we will see that uh, many member states also had a difficulty of how to uh, classify um, 
the energy sector, uh, especially um, when the EU FDI screening legislation uh, includes their infrastructure, technologies, and inputs. And we can say that, uh, you know, different energy activities or energy sector companies could be, you know, belonging to any of these, of these groups. So we can see a very distinct classification of the energy sector in this legislation. So we have a very broad classification, like for example, here we see uh, in France, basically generally energy supply is, is covered. Yeah, whatever is related to the energy, uh, energy supply. In Czech Republic, we have, a, for example, a very detailed list of different energy related activities that, that are then subject for, for screening. Or for example, in Austria, which followed the EU FDI screening legislation format and has uh, infrastructure, uh, technologies and resources, we can see that energy power supply is included in the several categories. Um, here are some, some more examples. Yeah, in, in some uh, countries like, for example, Poland, they, they prefer rather than covering sectors, covering the activities of particular companies that they would like to protect um, and to look at the foreign investments into those companies. So they have a very detailed list. Yeah, others, for example, again, like Slovenia, they fit energy, energy storage, different energy technologies into these three categories that as we see in the, in the FDI uh, screening regulation. What is the result of it? is um, quite a heterogeneous picture uh, among the member states in the way how they cover the energy sector. Uh, and also um, it creates a certain um, uncertainty for uh, foreign investors um, when they uh, invest in companies somehow related to the, uh, to the energy sector. Because so far the authorities in the member states have been quite cautious and applied a very broad understanding of these sectors and coverage. So a lot of lots of different transactions have been uh, have been reportedly uh, notified. <clears throat> um, now, besides the uh, national FDI screening legislation, uh, there is also a list of project and uh, projects of the European importance. And uh, in the field of energy, I just uh, selected the projects of the this uh, trans-European networks for energy. Uh, in, relation, in relation to these projects um, or companies that participating in this, in this project, there is a special role of the European Commission, uh, which um, basically has a um, opportunity to provide a comments or, or opinion based on the public security if uh, certain investment um, happens in one of these, uh, in one of these uh, wider projects. In this case, the member state which is uh, carrying out the screening will have to take into account uh, the com commission's position or commission opinion on this issue. Uh, and um, we will see, I mean, after one year of the implementation of the FDI screening uh, regulation, we'll have the first report. So then we actually will see, you know, how many, uh, how many, tra how many transactions have been actually um, related to these projects and uh, what was the what was the role of the or position of the European Commission we'll, we have to see in the in the first report um, so as a result <clears throat> basically we have now a um, multiple um, regulatory frameworks which will affect um, or already affecting uh, the Chinese um, investments as a non-EU investors uh, in the energy sector uh, so, um, as we discussed uh, in the field of merger control, uh, it has been relatively unproblematic because there uh, the criteria is only competition and also many transactions do not reach the EU level thresholds. So many mergers have been uh, examined by the competition authorities of the member states. Uh, I hope that uh, our um, uh, other speakers today will give us some examples of such transactions that have been, that have been examined at the national level. Uh, secondly, we have now FDI screening on the basis of security and public order. There again, the last word is after the member states uh, who making the ultimate decision in each case. We also see that there is a very heterogeneous picture in the way how member states have included or not included different energy related activities in their FDI screening legislation. 
but there is also a cooperation mechanism where European Commission and other member states can make, um, can make comments, uh, opinions to the member states that are undertaking screening. And something which is um, upcoming and to watch for is that um, this year Commission is uh, um, uh, concluding the public consultation about this um, foreign subsidies screening mechanism. Uh, and um, it um, expected that later this year it will turn into a legislative proposal and we will have an additional screening uh, based on the, on the foreign subsidies, uh, something which would apply some state aid control to a foreign, uh, to the foreign uh, in investments, foreign acquisitions. So that is, that is the framework, so to say, at the, at the EU level that I would like to present uh, today. Um, and I look forward to discuss it and also compare it with the situation on the ground in, in the member states. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. It was very interesting. I was not really aware how complex this whole framework is. Let's now turn uh, to uh, exact cases. And I now turn to Tiago Carvalho and ask him to start his presentation on Chinese investment in the Portuguese power grid. So we have uh, a case study uh, of this topic. Tiago, the floor is yours. And good morning and good afternoon, <laughs> if that's the case. Everyone, let's just share the presentation. Okay. So, good morning again. Uh, I'm um, Tia Carvai. I'm a researcher in the Orient Institute in Portugal. I'm bringing you here the Chinese investment in the Portuguese power grid. I'll give a quick overview on the Chinese investment in the power sector. The, um, I'll explain the Portuguese power grid. I will present uh, major events regarding this subject. And then the, the main investors in the Portuguese power grid, China Tree Gorges, State Grid, and other minor investors. Uh, so the aim of this presentation is to identify the Chinese investments in the Portuguese power grid. I must highlight a difficulty in um, mapping these investments because the main uh, online databases don't have uh, all the investments and the, the numbers they use normally are not uh, the correct ones. So you must, I, I had to research the, 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 the local media and the, um, and the authorities, but many of these things are not completely uh, available online. But since this is my um, PhD, this is on my PhD uh, thesis, um, I'm searching for this for uh, some time now. So in terms of uh, the global perspective on the Chinese investments in the power sector, uh, I'm looking to, in the European um, into the, the Europe. Uh, Portugal highlights because it has invest, investments in the grid and the, in the renewable energy. And uh, also a big difference from other countries like Italy and Greece that also have investments in their grid operators is that the Portuguese ones are completely uh, private. While the Greek and Italians uh, have, still have state control on those companies. So in terms of the Portuguese power grid, there are four big uh, segments, the generation, transport, distribution, and supply. And uh, you can see the, um, there are mainly two uh, companies here, the EDP and REN. These are two companies that were, that have uh, the major investor is a Chinese investor. And these companies, um, why do they have, have such uh, big market shares in Portuguese sector? Is because after the revolution in 1974, the Portuguese sector was uh, nationalized and they created EDP. And uh, Ren was part of EDP in that time. So EDP had all the, um, had all the market. <laughs> and nowadays there is a, um, a trend to liberalization in generation and supply. Actually, they are full, um, they are full free to competition. So that's why the ADP share is uh, reducing uh, year after year. Uh, 
but on transport and distribution, they did work on concessions. And um, REN is the, is the sole transporter system operator in Portugal and has a concession till 2057. So um, the major events, well, both these uh, two main Chinese investments in the Portuguese power grid happened uh, in the context of the economic and financial crisis of 2011. The Portuguese government agreed with, uh, to in order to receive the foreign aid um, to, to sell the sh its shares on these two companies. And uh, the Chinese investors were, the, um, were one of the, 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 the winners of this um, process. And this, um, in the following year, they start a strategic partnership with the uh, invested company. So REN, as the, the Portuguese TSO, had to be re recertified uh, because of the, the, there's a, the big issue here is an unbundling issue on the energy sector that the transport and the generator of, uh, companies must have to be completely separated. Um, and so it has this certification process also as the so pass with the European Commission. So the European Commission also um, gave his, its opinion and regarding this, this issue. And uh, it was approved uh, in the, the big, um, the main issue here is that the, port, the Chinese companies, uh, they are the, the, the main investor on these Portuguese companies, but they don't have the full control because they don't control um, they don't control 50% of the shares. And then you have the Portuguese FDI screening law uh, adopted in the 2014 after these investments. And uh, as far as I uh, researched, it's, it's never been used. In 2018, in a very different context, because there were more uh, negative um, issues on the Chinese investments. The Chinese Rigorses uh, wants the public acquisition offer to buy the remaining shares on EDP. The Portuguese regulator gave a, an opinion on that same year about another Chinese company that wanted to invest on the Portuguese uh, generation sector. And the, the opinion was that it couldn't, because it's a main uh, investor, the Chinese state of the, those state-owned companies. So the, 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 if that, that tank wanted to buy that company, it would have to sell uh, the generator um, assets that were on the free market. And, or the state grid that's on REN, is REN a main investor, will have to, to lose its voting rights. And this is a a complicated issue for uh, these companies. Uh, and then you have the EU uh, FDI screening regulation in the following year. And uh, that public offer ended uh, without any success in that year. So the main investor is actually is uh, Shannon Tree Gorges, is a state owned company that invests in EDP. This company uh, was created on the um, in the context of the, the um, you may have heard of it, the Three Gorges Dam is the biggest dam in terms of uh, electrical uh, output, uh, and but then it uh, developed in the in the in the other sectors on the renewable energy mainly on shore and offshore wind power and solar power. It also had received from the Chinese state um, as a subsidiary the CWE, which was a, a big international, it's a Chinese state-owned, but it, it has many uh, international projects on construction of dams. Actually, EDP and China Tigors have uh, much uh, similarities in their uh, business model, uh, because EDP also focus on renewables. It also started with uh, uh, the hydropower, in the Portuguese sector. And, uh, so, and like Shiny Tree Gorses, it had a lot of state support because it was a state-owned company back uh, in those days. And uh, it, that helped in its internationalization. And nowadays it's a very internationalized 
a company uh, and the Portuguese uh, business is not, um, it is reducing importance for this company because it has many other uh, important uh, market shares in other countries. So the investment we're talking about was on 2012, 2000 million euros. It also adds some loans uh, to the Portuguese company. Um, the Shanti Gorses then was able to nominate from, from that point on um, board members for the uh, EDP, but it didn't change the executive commission on EDP. You must also highlight, I must also highlight a research cooperation between these companies. There was lots of uh, follow-up investments and this was planned on the strategic agreement. Uh, I must highlight two in 2013 and 2017 that were on the Portuguese uh, assets of EDP. Others uh, are mainly on Brazil, assets of EDP, but also on Poland and Italy. And it's interesting to find that in the shiny tree gorges annual report, uh, EDP has a, a very relevant, uh, it's, it's highlighted. And, uh, and when shiny tree gorges states its international uh, operations, EDP appears uh, in, the, in the highlighted place. And you see here that uh, in Africa, those projects are mainly from the company that I told you about, the CWE company, mainly on the construction of dams. Um, and in Brazil, you have lots of projects with EDP. They also have a trying to uh, company for international projects, um, and they have the projects in Peru. So in 2018, Chantry was is trying to get uh, a much higher control of EDP and to buy the remaining shares that will be possibly cost it um, to 10,000 million euros. But it's, it was a very difficult job because as uh, EDP is very internationalized, it had uh, to be approved in many countries and uh, like the United States and that could present some problems and um, it could have uh, compromise the, that offer. But the problem turned out to be the, the own regulations of EDP. There's the maximum voting shares for a single shareholder of 25%. And the, the, in this general assembly, they voted against changing the, their rules. And the offer then uh, was canceled in April, 2019. Well, there's as consequences, and this is possibly related. Uh, the Chinese, the Chinese Guards leadership, which changed just after four months of this offering. There was this offering, it was problematic, could be problematic for state grid. And he stated, um, uh, the analysis stated it could have um, been a relation with these two because state grid was a priority. And there was also uh, another uh, Chinese company that uh, in the meanwhile invested on EDP uh, but after this, the, the offer was cancelled, it sold its shares on EDP. The motivations for these investments, they are the market seeking, seeking um, because EDP was on the main interesting markets for China Trigors as the United States market. The resource seeking in terms of know-how because EDP uh, in the renewable sector was a uh, have, and it has a subsidiary, EDP Renewables, it's a, a leading company worldwide. And strategic assets, because energy and power sectors, they have um, this dimension. And also financial, because EDP has a very nice um, dividend um, policy. It's interesting to compare the, the assets, because in 2011, the, these two companies were um, very similar in terms of assets. Um, but the Chinese company was on the um, uh, trend to, to, to increase and it's nowadays it's much uh, larger than the Portuguese company that have remained uh, more or less the, uh, the same. Uh, the second big investor is State Grid. State Grid, uh, it has a very um, 
strong domestic um, monopoly on the power grid as covers 88% of China power grid. It has, this, is, um, this map shows the invest, investments of state grid that uh, result in operating um, companies because it also has investments in construction. So in terms of REN, as I said, it, uh, it was part of EDP. It has separated and then sold and it's completely privatized. And unlike ADP, it, uh, it's, its internationalization is very, it's very reduced only on Shield and um, some small stakes in Spain and uh, Mozambique. This investment, it was very much, um, uh, it's not in the same dimension as the previous one. Uh, 387 million euros, also accompanied by loans to REN. The state renominates for the executive border, but it didn't change the, the administrative uh, board of REN. And they also have uh, the joint research center between these two companies. Market seeking, but in the last dimension here, because uh, REN was on Mozambique and um, also on the Spain sector. A resource seeking know-how because to integrate renewable energy in the, in the management of the, the, the power sector, strategic assets because REN also concession on the Portuguese transport grid and financial. Also dividends are very interesting in this company. Well, in comparing these two companies, state grid is a completely different dimension on, on one of the main um, companies worldwide in terms of revenues. And, but it's interesting to find out. Ren was a, already a mature company and been stable since there, while State Grid has been a, in increasing its, um, its assets. Other investments that we I must highlight there is this uh, uh, two companies that are the owner is the same, is CK Hutchinson. From uh, Hong Kong uh, enterprise, and it invested on the second uh, renewable generation company in Portugal in 2015 for 1,000 million euros. But then it sold it because the assets were turning to be on the free market, and they wanted a regular, um, stable income on those assets. Another company, Chinese company, that invested in the Portuguese power sector was um, China Triumph International Engineering Company. It invested to create two solar parks and they, they were sold, second one, even before it's completed because it's not yet completed. There was another company I'll talk to you about already, but this investment didn't succeed, but it was uh, important to the outcome of the Shantri um, Gwarza's offer to EDP. This is Detang, this is a Chinese power generation company that wanted to invest in the Portuguese company that on the generated um, sector, segment of the Portuguese power sector. And it asked for the Portuguese regulation for our opinion on the on that investment. And that opinion, uh, as I stated before, could have affected state grid investment in REN. And so the outcome was that um, the uh, French company Total uh, won that that process and bought uh, the Portuguese company. So it's concluding. We have only two long-term investors, China Three Gorges and State Grid, but they have a, a very important position in the Portuguese power sector, covering all segments. The motivation for those investments, uh, as, I have, as I have stated, are multiple dimensions. So I count eight investments from 2012 to 2017. They're two unsuccessful attempts. And the the total amount we're talking about are 5,000 million euros, plus the loans um, that were directly to those companies. So if you have any question, um, ask later, you can contact me directly. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very detailed and informative presentation. I think that it was quite well connected to the previous one, but then move forward uh, now outside the 
European Union, or quite close to it, and hopefully it will be inside sooner or later. So I'm turning now to Alexander Matkovic from Serbia, Belgrade, and ask him to show another uh, side of this story outsourcing pollution, environmental degradation related to Chinese projects in the Balkans. So Alexander, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, sorry, I was, I was muted. Uh, so thank you to Agnes and to the previous speakers. Um, I must say in advance, this is um, just the start of the research, so I must, uh, uh, state that. Uh, basically, I'll be uh, showing a mixed perspective. One would be to basically show you just an overview of what the Balkans investments from Chinese companies is at the current moment in the energy sector. And then basically, I will focus on Serbia and in particular, a, a very concrete company named Ling Long Tires, which is uh, the biggest investment in Serbia by far, and 800 million euros. And uh, also, it was one of the most contested in terms of the pollution that it may uh, contribute to Serbia and the region. So with that in mind, as I said, I offer a mixed perspective. One will be like a macro perspective on the Balkan investments and one will be a more Serbian oriented perspective. So let's start. Um, just a second. So uh, I want just to show a little bit of background so that we can understand the geopolitical um, dynamics here. So. Since 2014 and even early on, uh, the Chinese government has been slowly enacting more stricter and stricter um, environmental uh, protection laws and regulations. One would be uh, also related to the um, Belt and Road Initiative. So it was uh, initiated by the Chinese Banking Regulatory Commission, which issued the Green Credit Directive as meant to supporting Chinese stakeholders, while at the same time, not uh, polluting or not investing into polluting uh, projects outside uh, of China. This is also one of the most important uh, um, uh, regulatory directives since it is also one that is the most, most often not uh, respected in Serbia and abroad. So that will be one. Uh, the war on pollution was declared in 2014. Environmental protection laws were made stricter, including increase, increased penalties. So as of now, as actually as of 2015, Chinese regulators can issue uh, penalties on a day-by-day -day basis. So if you do happen to produce more sulfur dioxide, for example, and you do not uh, close down your factory or uh, in, you know, uh, make a, any sort of adjustments in that regard, you will be fine on a day-by-day -day -day basis. Um, that also uh, went uh, for the, uh, that also got translated into practice. For example, I mentioned Ling Long, I'll return to it later. So it's a tire producer and it made its own globalization strategy to escape what's been uh, happening in China. And that is that in 2017s, over 20 of the dirtiest producers have been either closed down or issued penalties as a consequence of this environmental prote protection laws, inclu including the so-called tire city of the Bang, where uh, various Chinese tire producers have been also fined. This is actually a novelty. And that is that was leading up to what Xi Jinping was uh, saying in uh, uh, September 22 last year that China was supposed to uh, reach carbon neutrality by 2016. How does that relate to the outsourcing of pollution? Well, some of the companies that have been fined or were supposed to be fined, like Ling Long, have actually started to export their dirty industry uh, outside of uh, China through the Belt and Road Initiative or on their own. So this is just the background of this geopolitical uh, rivalry, so to speak. Uh, on the EU side, actually, Xi Jinping's statement was uh, an answer to what's been also happening in the EU. And I won't uh, go into too much details. I suppose that some of you may already know this. Uh, the EU has also announced that it will uh, attempt to go uh, carbon neutral by 2015, or at least lower emissions to 55%, at least from 1919 uh, levels by 2030. Uh, it has also been uh, instigating anti-dumping duties on Chinese uh, tires and Chinese uh, tire production companies in uh, May 2018, which was exactly the time that the Serbian president Alexander Vucic visited Beijing and negotiated, and this is very important, through an intergovernmental deal 
um, the building of Lilingwang factory in Zrenjanin. So this is also how Serbia, for example, and this is apart from Bosnia and Herzegovina, the main example in the Balkans, uh, how it operates with through the Belt and Road Initiative and with Chinese company it, because uh, it uh, it uh, signs intergovernmental agreements. It bypasses the need for local tenders. So this is one of the points that will be clu- crucial later on. And this was also a practice that led 26 uh, members of parliament to write a letter to the European Commission uh, stating their concerns over uh, Chinese industrial investments into Serbia. So we have a contrasting picture. At the same time, well, both China and the EU are trying to lower uh, their carbon uh, footprint. Uh, the outsourcing of dirty industry in uh, Serbian grows. It's not only, of course, the Chinese uh, uh, guilt, so to speak. It's also from the Serbian government and uh, the Bosnian government and the Balkans governments, which actually do rely mostly on coal power still and are at once the, well, one of the highest polluters uh, in Europe. For example, only the Kostola Sturman uh, power plant produces as much pollution as was done in a famous study, as much as all of the thermal power plants in Europe combined. So it's, it's that sort of a deal. So that's why it's also a good example. So uh, at the same time, uh, while Europe is phasing out fuel, fossil fuel subsidies, I will, as I will show later on, uh, Exim Bank and China Development Bank are actually financing the development of uh, such uh, um, uh, of coal-based and fuel-based uh, thermal power plants. So. Uh, as I said, uh, there are also there's also a problem with local officials uh, relying on FBI. I uh, I use a stack here uh, quotation by Alexander Vucic, the Serbian president, who actually acknowledged that this is uh, um, that this is the reality that the governments of uh, uh, China and Serbia do have these agreements and that they are in fact outsourcing. So we have a confirmation from one of the state's heads of the Balkans, Alexander Vucic from Serbia. So. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the near pollution crisis and um, coming to think how I would present this uh, to you with just as in a summary way. I thought about dividing this presentation into two sections. One would be ac- the actual accusations of different Chinese companies and different uh, thermal power plants projects, for example, uh, in, in Serbia and uh, the Balkans. And one would be to uh, show you just a list of bro- the projects which have been uh, now signed uh, uh, signed agreements to for investments or are about to do so. So I mean, my, I chose the Ling Long uh, example, which I will return to later, uh, as an as as a specific as a prime example of how this outsourcing works. So at once you have more stricter environmental laws in China and Europe, and because Serbia has a special relation to China, as you all know. Um, and it's also near Europe, but it's not in the European Union. This creates a sort of specific dynamics whereby uh, Chinese companies and uh, finances can uh, utilize local reliance on FDI and local reliance on coal-based projects to uh, set, uh, so to speak, a base that is near Europe, but at once uh, that is um, uh, beneficial to the companies which are uh, which would be fined under the new environmental protection laws in China. Uh, for the local um, uh, population, it's, 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 it's at the same time, uh, there are benefits. For example, your stepwise increase in finance for projects that would be would have to be financed either way, like Kostolac and Tuzla, which I mentioned. Uh, but at the same time, there are uh, also uh, uh, there are also liabilities in terms of increased pollution or uh, probability of those coal-based uh, financial projects to be, for becoming stranded assets in the way that they will not be cost-effective in five to six years. So uh, this is just a list, basically, of accusations which have been put, sorry, which have been put forward for different uh, projects of uh, coal-based uh, or um, or copper mines, for example. Uh, uh, power plants and uh, other investments projects in the uh, Balkans as a whole. So um, this comes actually from uh, an investment watch um, uh, source, which I quote later on. So as you can see, I've highlighted these are, for example, thermal power plants Tanari in Bosnia and Herzegovina, thermal power plants in Tuzla, um, and uh, thermal power plant in Skustolac, also Linglong Factory. They uh, all share, um, they were accused in the media, of course, but they all share uh, one of the most fundamental problems and that, that, that is that the environmental impact assessment studies were either not conducted or not public, as in this case of Stanari uh, Thrown Power Plant in Bosnia-Herzegovina, 
or they were flawed. For example, like in Linglonga factory, there has been accusation of uh, a so-called salami, salami slicing, which means that you basically do environmental impact assessment on specific parts of an investment rather than a whole investment, which means that you will uh, pass the environmental impact assessments more easily if you, for example, only do an, an assessment for adjacent buildings, which do not produce that much uh, pollution, such as, uh, um, uh, such for example, camps for workers or uh, storage facilities, while at the same time you then, um, you, you attempt to uh, present this as a, um, as passed as a whole project. So these are, this has also been, um, uh, this has also caused, caused local population to protest, as in the case of uh, Ling Long, so, uh, and also the, public um, discussions regarding these environmental impact assessments were never public at all in the terms of that they have been closed uh, to view only for um, certain as, as experts who were involved in their studies. So uh, this is one of the reasons that is, um, these investments were uh, accused of being uh, environmentally damaging. Uh, some were actually, uh, some have actually produced environmental damages already, such as the case with the number eight HBIS Medvedevo. It's a steel plant where actually uh, there have been noted uh, red rains in uh, the Smedvedevo and the town of Smedvedevo. And there have also been some sort of uh, social movements and protests which have uh, addressed this issue, but it has never been resolved. So uh, these are some of the problems that the Chinese investments uh, in the Balkans face. Uh, and also another uh, important system, another important uh, point would be, since Serbia is not an EU country, but is an EU accession country, it needs to be part of the environmental trading system, the, um, the system that's been implemented since the early 2000 in Europe. Uh, most of these environmental impact assessments actually either miscalculate or don't calculate at all the impact of, for example, sulfur dioxide or uh, carbon dioxide or dioxide emissions, uh, or for example, as was uh, the case in uh, the thermal power plant Tuzla, they are not monetized. So the CO2 emissions are not monetized until, for some reason, until 2034. So they delay the um, the cost or, uh, or belittle the cost of CO2 emissions that the uh, thermal power plant would have to pay or trade in order to uh, continue its production, which means that in reality, it would, it would uh, mainly become a stranded asset if it was to pay uh, for the environmental emissions uh, that it actually produced. So in, in this sense, the environmental impact studies are flawed. So uh, this is uh, from an investment watch report that I quote later on. So um, and if anybody needs this, uh, this information, I can also pass you the presentation afterwards. So uh, as you can see, see, here is the map of uh, all the investments minus Medrevo, which was not included here um, in a map. This, so as you can see, uh, most of this uh, relates here to drone power plants or um, or uh, the Serbian automotive industry. For example, Meitai is uh, a producer of car parts. It has been known for um, uh, not uh, not recycling wastewater and dumping into the Tudelupul River. Uh, same thing is also uh, one of the key issues with uh, the Ling Long guitar factory in Zrenjanin and also at the Zijin Copper mining bore so and these are of course not the, the um, not all the problems that have been faced uh, by these uh, investments also problems uh, occurred when housing uh, chinese worker for example and those have also been protested by chinese workers in on board who were saying that they were uh, the freedom of movement was curtailed they have uh, problem with, with problems with uh, heating and water so in terms of uh, these uh, investments it, it's not only pollution that they cause in terms of damaging the environment but also in damaging the local population or the local working population that is involved in their construction um, also this is just uh, not that important point but as you can see uh, this is uh, how costolas looks like I was there in uh, last year with a couple of Chinese researchers, so it's not at all uh, a lovely place to be, even if you're working at Kostolac power plant. Uh, so there are um, like labor encampment facilities and stuff like that. So this is one of the problems that uh, these Chinese investments face. Uh, in the case of the Ling Long uh, factory, uh, this is important, as I said, because um, 
uh, several reasons. So it was uh, for the first, it's uh, the largest investment in Serbia at 800 million euros. Um, also, it's one of the largest factories with 300,000 square meters uh, located in Zrenjanin, in a town that is actually already noted for uh, its environmental uh, problems. And uh, it's also a private company, the company that, as I said, has been turned down uh, to the EU, but it also at, one, at once exports its tires to produce to automobile producers like Volkswagen. So it has motives to move its production to Serbia. It has its partners in the EU, but at the same time, by moving into Serbia, it will not have to pay, pay any fines or face any restrictions that it, or, or FDI screening as uh, the colleague uh, before me was uh, talking about, because Serbia has uh, almost little to no FDI screening facilities, which means that it can more easily open up its plant. And this was actually done by an intergovernmental agreement, as I was saying, which was signed in Beijing, Beijing in 2018. Uh, so a couple of months after the company was turned down by the EU. And also uh, at the same time, it's interesting to know that, that uh, it's not only this company that is, is going to produce um, uh, large uh, changes in Zrenian or Serbia. There has also been um, a sort of a new practice that the company itself, uh, through intergovernmental agreements, is opening up tenders in Serbia for highways, for example, from Novi Sad to Zrenian and Belgrade, which is one of the first um, the first example is that the Chinese company is open, opening up uh, local tenders through intergovernmental agreements uh, so that it can actually uh, call upon more Chinese companies to construct the actual highways. So basically, uh, this sort of practice is, would be considered going rogue uh, outside of Serbia or if, if the ice cream facilities are in place or if this was done through local tenders. So you have a Chinese company that is doing all of this. Uh, it has also been uh, subsidized. A couple of farm lands have been uh, basically granted into its possession in uh, Zanyanin near um, a lake called uh, Tsarski Broad. This was one of the largest uh, uh, protected areas of wildlife in Serbia, and it has been not transparent. So the studies and the public discussion uh, were not transparent to local population. I was actually um, uh, a part of one such uh, um, public uh, discussion, and I was one, maybe two or three people to get in uh, while the protests were going outside. So for some reason, this is not transparent to the uh, broader public in Serbia. Uh, also in terms of uh, investment structure, so uh, as you can see, new production equipment uh, has a lion's share of, um, its, uh, of the investment. Well, salaries uh, are actually just a minor part um, you know, of Ling Long's investment in, uh, in Zrenjanin that have been calculated that it will employ 1,500 people, out of which 200 will be uh, Chinese engineers, basically. And uh, this means that basically, uh, in terms of benefit, economic benefit to the local population, the wages will be the same as in Serbia, which will, which will be around 400 to 500 euros as a basic. Uh, as a basic wage. So this is, uh, in terms of economic impact, a, a rather questionable investment uh, um, as to whether there is any uh, economic impact in terms of higher salaries or technological transfer, since the Chinese engineers will be uh, coming from China and there will be uh, little to no um, uh, transfer in, in that sense in practice. So uh, also why I chose this example, it is because, as I said, one of the higher Highest Chinese investments in Serbia. Uh, I have uh, here, um, I created a table of Chinese investments uh, with Hong Kong and without Hong Kong into Serbia. Uh, as you can see, Ling Long, which is in gray, is actually the, the, the most largest single investment uh, in a 10 year period in Serbia, which is again, one of the main fields of Chinese investments in the Balkans. Uh, also, um, uh, Coming to um, a more a more broader picture again, um, this is uh, based on a global development policy centers study of um, in Chinese investments, financial investments into um, uh, and the energy sector. So as you can see here, Bosnia and Herzegovina is one of the most uh, uh, far-reaching in, uh, investment uh, locations in terms of uh, coal-related uh, projects, which I will focus on. Later on, uh, while Serbia is the second place with coal actually uh, taking the lion's share of, 
uh, investment. So this is uh, these are figures that are actually calculated for the Exim Bank, the Chinese Export Import Bank, and the Chinese uh, Development Bank. So uh, in terms of concrete projects which you come out with this, uh, you have uh, three that are actually existing. Those are called Stolas Bay, as, as I've uh, stated. Uh, that's a thermal power plant. The Tuzla 7, also a thermal power plant uh, in Bosnia and Stanari, which was uh, built uh, by the Long Tang Electric Corporation. And as you can see, I highlighted in, I highlighted in, in purple the China Machine Engineering Corporation, since it um, also appears in several projects and also it appears in the Ling Long project uh, as well. Uh, it mostly constructs uh, highways or expansions. Of, um, uh, concrete uh, thermal power plant units. So uh, the three uh, uh, investments that have been built are the Stanari, Kostolets, and Tuzla, while this, the second uh, row of the tables uh, has um, a list of, um, um, of investments, investments which have signed agreements but have not yet received some permits or have been delayed. So um, due to various reasons. So uh, these are also investments which, as you can see, range from Militi in uh, Greece to Rovinari in Romania, and also uh, a lot of them are in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which, as you remember, was um, one of the highest, received one of the highest coal related project investments from Exim and uh, CDB um, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So uh, this is also, uh, in terms of what's planned for the future, this is a list of projects that will be, uh, can be expected to take place in terms of uh, financing uh, energy related uh, investments in uh, the region. So most of them, most of these uh, have been only, um, for example, uh, um, the the Cupres Wind Park. Uh, it was there was an agreement signed uh, at the Budapest China Central Eastern European Summit in 2017, but is still being waited to uh, uh, to get into concrete uh, production or permits. And uh, these are projects which, which, for example, in Serbia will be available mostly after 2025, according to the implementation plan for the current national strategy from 2017. So this is what we can expect for the future. Uh, I want to go now into more detail, but I'll be happy to answer the questions uh, uh, after the presentation. So thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. And now I'm turning to Alexandra Pilius. Uh, one of our hosts and ask her to stop recording.